Football encompasses many things. Delight and despair, pleasure and pain, affection and animosity. The story of Paul Canneville is one that is both fascinating and depressing in equal measures. Like many young boys, Paul Canneville dreamed of becoming a footballer. The roar of the crowd, thousands of people screaming your name. Sadly, Canners quickly found out the reality was not as glorious as it appeared. Paul Canneville was born in Middlesex in 1962 to Caribbean parents. Life for black immigrants in 1960s England was difficult. Racism was rife and the National Front, a far-right, whites-only political party, was prominent in the area. Canner's upbringing was particularly difficult, with his father walking out in the family early in Canneville's life. There was a lot of the National Front in the area, and not just coming from the community as well as the police. So, for me, it was just, I suppose, hard enough because my dad left when I was two years old. So, it's difficult for my mum to bring up me and my sister, and I made that difficult. Canneville admits that the departure of his father had a negative effect on him, and as a result, he made things difficult for his mother. I, I gave her too much trouble. I wanted this, I wanted that, but couldn't get it, so kind of went out and got it myself, kind of thing. For Canneville and so many young players that endured troubled upbringings, football was seen as an escape. Despite the football, he was still misbehaving and ended up in a juvenile detention centre. Football became the only constant in a troubled upbringing. Um, um, After running away, Canneville got his first chance with non-league Hillingdon Borough. He excelled and was in the first team by 16. Two seasons later, Chelsea came calling. After a successful trial, Canner signed on the dotted line and his dream had come true. Sadly, the dream would soon turn to a nightmare. Every player remembers their debut. It's the culmination of years of hard work. For Paul Canneville, it would be remembered for all the wrong reasons. England in 1982 was a different place to what it is today and professional football was still coming to terms with the rise of young black players. Skip forward to April 12th, 1982, and Chelsea travelled to Selhurst Park to face Crystal Palace. Paul Canneville is set to make his eagerly anticipated debut. Canners, the working class troublemaker for Middlesex, is about to make history and become the first ever black player to line out for Chelsea. However, what transpired on that infamous day would unearth a side of football that the youngster was not prepared for. As Canners went through his warm-up, a section of the Chelsea fans began to hurl racial abuse at the 20-year-old. In public, Canneville insisted the racial abuse motivated him to work harder. In private, though, the abuse was crushing his confidence. Although the abuse was consistent, Chelsea's form was not. They only retained their Division 2 status thanks to some final day heroics. Under John Neal, Canners played an important role in the team. Things were on the up. He was scoring goals, Chelsea were promoted, and he even met his father for the first time since he left. 
With the goals going in, he was beginning to feel the acceptance from the fans that he had desperately yearned for. Don't get me wrong, training, getting paid, paid for playing football, something that you like. Are you telling me you wouldn't go and do it? You wouldn't sacrifice being in the boot or something? I'm sorry, we had to learn how to clean our own shoes for my mum and our boots. You're telling me you wouldn't clean a professional man's boots to be a professional footballer? Um, yeah, it probably was hard, but I wasn't going to go back to let anybody spoil it. It was difficult at first, don't get me wrong, because I had to, I had to sit down and think, boy, am I ready to accept this? Because this wasn't just the start. I knew there was going to be more. I just didn't know how long, I didn't know how bad. It was, you know, I needed to show them how good I was. Everybody else knew how good I was. I needed to show them how good it was. Um, but give me the chance, don't get me wrong. It was, obviously, you want to... Your game becomes when you're confident. And if you're not confident, you make it difficult to try and make an input in a game. Um, and most times I didn't go out to warm up. I stayed in the changing room. That's how bad. Even when I was on the side on the bench in Stanford Bridge and the manager said, Paul, can't get more up. I'd just be right to my time. And like I played, I can't kind of even heard it. <laughs> just not to run past those same amount of men. I stayed there on the guard post. I could see them waving me, and I see them right there waving me. Come on, can you come back then? I didn't want to go back. Because I had to go past the same hand. Met any player that comes to play for Chelsea, whatever team, you want them to make them feel accepted yeah, and appreciated. If, why am I here? Why am I, what's the fact of me playing in a shirt of blue, which you're supporting, if you're not going to respect me or accept me? That don't make sense. What am I going to do? Go against you and score against me for you? Isn't it? Against you? No, man. I'm playing to win. And that was the whole team. So, yeah, it was, it was difficult, though. It was really was. Although the incidents of racism were common, it did not make them any easier. One particular incident in a reserve game clearly portrays the bigotry that ran deep in football at the time. Play against Millwall, and we all know that in that time they were notorious. And just before as we was warming up, I just saw three guys in pillar clothes. Um, Candace's Chelsea career came to an acrimonious ending following an incident with an unnamed teammate. He moved to Reading as a result. Unfortunately, heartbreak awaited him at his new club. Unlike Chelsea, the Reading faithful were good to Candace from the beginning and accepted him with open arms. Tragedy was striked though, three months into his debut season. On the 21st of October 1986, a tackle by Sunderland's Dave Swindlehurst resulted in Cannaville sustaining a dislocated knee, torn cartilage and a rupture to his cruciate ligament. He would never play for Reading again. Even nice, I was injured. When I went down, I looked at the gates. I looked at the CSB. It was like your son. So my teammate was just rushing, just relax. I couldn't understand what's wrong with you. So I looked at the leg, and that was twisted up one way, twisted the other. And I was like, I'm sorry, you can't put that in. So what was that? Age just 24, the injury would signal the start of a downward spiral in Cannibal's life and one that would seem to come to drug addiction. He took a deep breath before uttering the next few words. Um, I've got cancer. 
Canaveral was in a very vulnerable place and the news that he was now fighting cancer, along with depression and drug addiction, hit him hard. Sadly, the cancer would take over his life. And that hit me like a thunderstorm, trust me. Um, I've had it three times now and the first time I'm going to say I took it very lightly when I nearly died. Children have always been a major part of Canaveral's life. He has fathered 11 children with 10 different women. However, as with all aspects of his life, tragedy was never too far away. To hold his son in his arms and watch him breathe his last breath was a harrowing experience that Cannibal would carry with him for the rest of his life. I took it upon myself and realised, Paul, oh, this isn't the rule I wanted to go for again. I went back into rehab and I sorted it out and came back to where I am. But that was really hard. Um, the cancer was really hard. But as I said before, um, there was a reason for it. Um, that's why I can share and open up and talk about it. Um, so if that can help anybody, Despite negativity, which has been omnipresent throughout Cannibal's life, the positivity with which he spoke to us is a testament to his own character. Depression is a major talking point in the sport today, and it can only be helped through talk and people opening up about their problems. Despite the dark days, Paul Cannibal has risen above it all and acts as a beacon of hope for anyone that is struggling today. The overriding theme from speaking to Canners is that talk is important when it comes to depression. If you are experiencing bad times, don't bottle it up. Speak to someone. If Paula kept quiet about his problems, who knows what could have happened. In the words of Elizabeth Wurzel, that's the thing about depression. A human being can survive almost anything as long as she sees the end in sight. But depression is so insidious and it compounds daily that it's impossible to ever see the end. The fog is like a cage without a key. For the full article on Paul Cannibal and more premium sports coverage, head over to punditarena.com.